Hello, you beautiful degenerates, and welcome to Links and Locks, the Action Network's golf betting podcast presented by Bet365. This is our Masters Tournament betting preview as it's time for the first major championship of the year here in 2024. We're going to an Augusta National Golf Club. You know it, we know it, and we couldn't be more excited to hand out a green jacket this week. Scotty Scheffler is the overwhelming betting favorite, and we'll get into him and everybody else at the top of the board later on in this show. First off, we're going to do our best bets, then we'll go through our course preview, give a, our outright bets, talk a little Tiger Woods, talk some one and done, go through the rest of our betting cards, and then we'll go through every golfer at 50 to 1 or shorter in the field this week whom we haven't already touched on. But first, let's get into our best bets. Nick, Welcome back. What is your best bet for the 2024 Masters Tournament? Yeah, thanks for the quick week off, the old anniversary with the wife. But we are going with a contrarian play right off the bat. Number grab, Ben on top 20 plus 280 ties in full. Awesome. I like Ben on this week too. Excited to hear your, your cap on that one. Spencer, what is your best bet for the Masters this week? So I'm going to pivot on the spot, Roberto. When I initially wanted to give this, it was going to be Chris Kirk over Eric Van Royen. Uh, in the words of Nick, that has left the station here. Like We have seen a 25-point move, and I don't want to give a stale number on this show. That's not going to be useful. If you can find that in the minus 110, the minus 120 range, that would still be my best bet there. But I'm going to pivot over to Austin Eckrote to make the cut. That is up to minus 120 now. I got that at minus 110, so we've experienced a little bit of movement in that direction also. But uh, I think it's a unique spot here for Eckrote that I'll talk about in a second. All right. Looking forward to hearing that one. As Eckrote already a winner this season on the PGA Tour at the Cognizant Classic in the Palm Beaches. For my best bet this week, I'm going to go with a matchup. And I'm going to bet on Max Homa at even money plus 100 to beat Colin Morikawa this week. I'm normally a Colin Morikawa guy, but I'm off the bandwagon, uh, at least right now. Before we get into that one, Nick, why are you backing Benny on and his broomstick this week? Yeah, um, well, obviously, lab putters. Shout out to all the lab gang out there. But overall, he grades inside the top 15 for expected proximity from the mid to long iron range. He is one of the best iron ball strikers we've seen on tour this year. I know everybody's going to talk about course history, and, and we can kind of check that box a little bit too. This is when he was a much more inferior golfer and way less well-rounded than he is now when we see with the scrambling and the putting, massive putting improvements, if you want to call it that, from where he was you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago. But his last three events, he missed a cut on the number twice and had a T33. So I, I think with just who he is as a player now, he's got a decent caddy that has been around Augusta many times, I think, with Ches Revy and Justin York. Um, and Ches, I think, made the cut twice, and Ben On is just such a different player. He's damn near the same type of iron player Ches Revy is. He's probably 60 yards longer off the tee, no offense, Ches. I just think that this is a really good course for a guy that, yeah, sure, you, you can kind of say the the form's in sketchy in a sketchy spot over the past two weeks, but other than that, he has been lights out this season. His real fault is he misses fairways, and that's not going to matter here at Augusta with how wide they are. I think it's a really good course comp. I think it's a guy that can get inside the top 10. Since he got back on the PGA Tour, because he was on the Corn Ferry Tour in 2022, Ben on hasn't had a, a week as poor around the green as he did last week. So I think that was kind of an abomination where he missed the cut. Also, really sure. poor putting week for him. Some really tough pin locations on those greens at TPC San Antonio. But he was still gaining over a stroke on approach per round in those two rounds at Valero. So he's striping the ball. He's long. His putter's improved, even though... We're kind of buying the dip after a poor performance last week. I think there's a lot to like about Ben on. So I'm going to be on him as well. And I'm tailing you on this one, Nick. So first in pod play on the first pick, let's ride here into major championship season. Spencer, why are you backing Austin Necro to make the cut this week? I think if there wasn't such a course demand here, like Nick kind of talked about this. Everybody wants to always discuss how Augusta National has the most rollover predictability of any venue on tour. And that makes a lot of sense. But I, I think you reach a certain perspective here where numbers on a lot of these names that are making their first appearance almost got skewed in the market. Like we can make an argument that there's certain players 
I'll use Jordan Spieth as an example where you look at his outright number and you're paying a built-in tax from the very start of this just because of the course history that comes into play here. I think when you look at a name like Austin Ekro, we don't have any course history to bake base things off of. And when that's the case, I thought markets were a little bit soft in some of those areas. So if you threw this event and you threw these, you know, sub 90 players onto any other course in the world, that's not Augusta national. And you ask me, what does my model think a fair price is for Ekro to make the cut in a top 50 and ties sort of a tournament? It hasn't been about minus 150 being the fair number there. Levin made cuts in 12 tournaments, a victory at the Cognizant Classic in March, a 37 spot increase in expected strokes gained around the green. When you compare his two-year baseline versus only his 2024 stats, I tried to be very cautious here. I think when you start extrapolating out the data and you start making projections that are too high, you run into a problem. So I gave Eckroat a 65th place projection in my sheet for course history returns. I mean, that that's outside of the top 50. I thought that was a very subdued number. Even at that price, minus 120 was a value. If all of a sudden I pushed him up the board and more into that fringe top 50 sort of a player. So, you know, give him an average finish of, let's say, 49th here, make a couple cuts, get himself into the weekend. If that was more of the projection we were actually looking at, he would have been the best value in my model to make the cut. So I always try to be cautious with the approach I'm taking because you do get this fiery bent grass greens. I know that the putter for me is not going to necessarily grade the way that you want 73rd overall in that projection, but top 15 for me on these more challenging par four holes. I do think that some of these similar course comps that I have give him a safe enough floor here to where I don't know what the ceiling actually is in his first attempt, but I think the floor in this potential opportunity here gives us a goal for that. As I said, it's like minus 150 is more of the proper price for me. So I'm just grabbing value where I could find it. It's been one of those markets this week. We've discussed this for feels like the last two or two or three months on the show. Things are moving quickly. Like a lot of these bets, by the time I release them over in a Discord chat, they're they're gone, you know, within an hour of things. But I still think there's enough value in that number there at minus 120. Love it. Hey, uh, Spencer, real quick. The current market that I could see for me personally is minus 125. And I was, I have Ekro question mark written down in my notes for something I wanted to talk to you guys about because he graded right one spot in front of Ben on for the expected proximity from those mid to long iron ranges. And obviously we've seen Ekro really step on the scene this year. So I'm, I'm with you on him. Is 125 okay? I know me personally and, and you personally, we're usually looking for 30 points of value. If you said proper is closer to minus 150, are we, uh, I need an impact play. I got room on the card. Are you okay with me firing away at minus 125? Yeah, I, I still think there's enough value on that number. I, I mean, like the concern comes down to the putter and him playing this the first time. But um, to me, that is legitimate sharp movement that's been pushing this number over the past. Like it's beyond just me releasing a play. There's, I think, a lot of sharp people that are probably right. uh, realizing that Ekrod has a profile here where if you want to run things, and and I do, I my model goes from a two-year running perspective with it. There's a lot of missed cuts that you go into deeper into that profile. But if you look at just what he's produced over, you know, those last 12 results that I talked about, 11 made cuts there, he has the victory. There has been this safer built-in floor to the equation. So I, I think some models might be building this out incorrectly for him. And And as I said, it's like, even if I gave him a 50th place grade in my model out of 80 something players here. I still don't think I'm doing him necessarily an overwhelming amount of justice. If all of a sudden that turns him into the best value in my model inside of this market. So um, I think that that, you know, numbers that we're talking about, Nick would be probably more of where we're discussing fair being when I'm making him the worst golfer I can be in my sheet in those areas. But when I, when I push this more into like the middle range of him being just an average player at this course, that's where the value really starts to uh, exceed the expectations. One other thing to note on Ekrod is that he is a very streaky golfer. You look at his last 25 rounds on data golf, you'll see that he gained strokes on approach in five in a row in from May to June last year. Then he lost on approach six in a row after that. Then there's some tournaments without data, but right now he's on the hottest streak of approach that he's ever been on in his life gained on five in a row. Five tournaments in a row at nearly a stroke per tournament 
as the lowest uh, amount, 0.96 at the Players' Championship. Every other tournament in the last five, he's gained well over a stroke uh, per round on approach. So he is absolutely striping the ball. He's very straight, been at or above field driving accuracy in eight straight tournaments. So uh, actually make it 11 straight tournaments. So that combination of playing out of the fairway and really strong approach play, all he's got to do is not bleed strokes on the green, and he should be someone who can make the weekend. And Spencer, just one other thing to note, the cut this week, because there are only 89 players, it's not 65 in ties like usual, it's 50 in ties, but also you can be outside the top 50 if you are within 10 shots of the lead. We saw that, uh, I believe, at the um, at the Genesis, where players yep. within 10 shots made the cut who were outside the top 50 in ties. So it's possible that you don't even need to be in the top 50. Uh, but getting into my best bet, I like Homa over his fellow Cal Bear, Colin Morikawa. Speaking of data golf, they do a cool job of tracking how golfers do in different respects of strokes gained. And since Colin Morikawa left Cal in 2019, he had never had a span of three consecutive tournaments where he's lost on approach ever. Uh, I think he's only done it with two tournaments in a row once before this last month. Uh, since he turned pro in 2019. And even if you assumed when he lost, even if you assumed when there's no data that he lost strokes, he's never lost strokes on approach in three straight. So it's pretty rough that this is the form that he enters the masters with. I know that he, we know Spencer, you talked about how there's sticky course history here, but Colin Morikawa's approach play is not nearly at the level that it's been at since he turned pro. That is the bread and butter of his game. He's also somebody who is short off the tee. So, Previously, when his six iron proximity was shorter or was closer than the average PGA Tour player's pitching wedge, that wasn't as big of a deal that he was playing from further back in the fairway, farther back in the fairway. But now he's playing from farther back in the fairway. His approach play isn't the weapon that it once was, and he's not a great putter. The around the green game has been much better this year than it's been in the past, but historically, that hasn't necessarily been a big strength of his game either. So if you take away the one asset that he really has, especially on this golf course where the 51-yard wide fairways are going to make a lot of uh, more wayward but long drivers have a better advantage over him being back a little farther in the fairway. So I think this is just a poor course fit this week for Colin Morikawa given the struggles of his iron game. I like Homa in that he is somebody who has a bad narrative around him that he can't get it done in the majors, doesn't have a finish, I think better than a top 30 here at Augusta National. He's also gaining nearly double the amount of strokes as Morikawa on approach so far this season. And like I said, he's significantly longer, but he also has a big edge with the flat stick as well. So for all those reasons, at even money, it was too much for me to pass up on Max Homa versus Colin Morikawa. You guys have any thoughts on those two guys? I'm down with Fade Morikawa. I just don't know if I, I personally am not a Max Homa guy. And looking at the market, man, he's a dog to Corey Connors. Slight favorite over Jason Day, dog to Sam Burns. That makes sense. Sam Burns on well, a little bit of a heater, but a significant dog to like Degala. I, I just don't know how. Like I don't like the market to influence my decision making that much because how many times I've been on the wrong side of it. I, it's just like all right, build my numbers and then kind of weigh it to where the market is. And I'm not nearly as down on Max Home as what the market is. That's just my only concern. There is the red flag of how much they don't like Homa. But having said that, they don't really like Morikawa too, but he is a favorite in those matchups. So are you getting, um, you're getting plus money on, on Homa there in that matchup then, right? That was plus 100. Yes. Plus. Okay. I also yeah, think. I I'm just more, never seen Morikawa in bad form. So I, I'm, I think I'm with you there. Just like follow the clues. Something's not right with his swing. And as much as people want to talk about course history, I think for these elite players, just being in form means a ton. And Morikawa also is the reason why I'm making this bet. If I find somebody better to back than than Max, I think that would also be worth looking at, or sure. if other people have something available. I also think that at plus 250 to miss the cut, I'm intrigued on Morikawa there. Just I like because, that. Well, I also want to see what happens with the weather this week, but we'll get into that in a little bit. But I think the floor is not super high if Morikawa isn't on his hate game, which is why I'm targeting him in a matchup this week. I feel like maybe that route that you talked about of a miscut might be the way that I prefer more. To me, the price of plus 100 is about 
where I have it being accurate. Like, I don't necessarily have much of an edge one way or another. I agree with your general assessment of that where, you know, I know Nick talks about the market being down on Homa. I, I truly believe that's just the major championship. If you want to call it stink that he has on him to where he has not produced in major championships historically. And if you look specifically at the masters here, he doesn't have anything within the top 40. So I think that that's probably an overcorrection a little bit by the market. Um, maybe not specifically so much in that matchup, but if we want to talk about him being an underdog across the board to everybody, I, I think Homa is a high ceiling play. If he puts the pieces together, I made this argument last year at the masters that I thought we were going to finally get that performance from him where he jumps into the top 20 and really solidifies himself. And we didn't quite get that, that, uh, production from him. I kind of think that that's what's going to happen this year. Massive climber in my model for upside. The safety numbers are give and take with it, but um, I- I'm not necessarily on either one of them. They're both negative leverage in my model pretty much from anything that I'm looking at. So it's I don't want to say that they're two fade candidates because I think Homa from DFS purposes is much more intriguing to consider. I, I mm-hmm. I kind of like the upside that he possesses and we've talked about, and I just mentioned, I do think that Morikawa is one of those names that maybe has a little bit more miscut equity than people believe he does. But um, I mean, if you want to get technical of where they're at in my head to head model, they are within two spots of one another and Morikawa is the two spots better. So, I mean, that's essentially going to put us in a range where it's like minus 102 is the proper price. It's just, there's just not much there. I've also been intrigued by Homa because his lack of driving accuracy recently has been what's been hurting him. He's gained on a stroke on approach. He's gained strokes on approach, sorry, in every single round so, or in every single tournament so far this season. But his off the tee play in Florida looks like he found the water on some inopportune times. And even at the API, when he finished in the tie, in a tie for eighth, he lost strokes off the tee. So his distance here will play and the lack of driving accuracy i think gets made up for because of the wide fairways but gentlemen we've talked about a little bit about the golf course let's get into our full course preview for augusta national golf club spencer what are you weighing in your model this week so whether you're some casual fan or or a diehard who really eats sleeps and breathes golf every single week like augusta national doesn't need that much of an introduction it's the most iconic venue in the world for a reason You have these wide open fairways, nearly 20 yards in width. That's going to present this feel of a course that is a long driver's paradise. The one thing I want to note to that, though, is that particular skill set will only take you so far. When you look at these massive undulations and multiple tiered perspectives of the putting surface on all 18 holes, it's one of the reasons the long-term data has generated a 4.6% enhancement when looking into the dispersion of scoring for strokes gained around the green inside of my model. I don't want to make it sound as if struggling with that portion of your game is going to be a death sentence for your success. Although you are going to have to be elite in other areas if you want to traverse these green complexes that typically do take multiple showings to get accustomed to its unique layout. That's one of the reasons no first-timer has won this tournament since Fuzzy Zeller in 1979. I don't think that that's a reason to not necessarily back somebody. I know Nick will get into this a little bit later when he talks about Oberg and names like that. This is the best crop of newcomers we've probably ever had before. You have an elite, in my opinion, I know the word generational, if you want to talk about football and all that, like the word generational is always being attached to everybody. But I legitimately think Oberg is a generational driver of the ball with massive upside. Uh, I don't necessarily want to put him into that same mold as everybody else. We've gotten a lot of experience from him, played Ryder Cups. Like this is a golfer that is ready to win. Wyndham Clark, same answer. You don't normally see golfers at this point of their career get this, this, you know, at the age of 30 years old or whatever Clark actually is at this point to where you become an elite golfer in the world by, by not playing the Masters previously to that. So I don't necessarily want to eliminate players from the outright pool for that reason. And, and I think that some of those narratives become very interesting from a betting perspective because uh, first timers. I think for DFS purposes, people aren't going to want to play them for that reason. Like that overcorrection that happens in the market is what's really interesting. And from a betting perspective, that's what we're trying to find. We're trying to find these market incongruities that overreact to specific narratives that don't fit the mold there. And and I even talked about it with Spieth already. You have this answer with Jordan Spieth where my model likes him fine. I don't have a problem with Jordan Spieth in a vacuum situation there, but... 
you have a problem on the secondary returns when you take a golfer that if this is not Augusta National and, and you throw this anywhere else in the world, speed is what? 40 to 1? 35 to 1? All of a sudden now we're talking about a sub 20 to 1 golfer where there's a built-in tax that gets up front. You have to pay for it. So, you know, I do think that this is a very nuanced facility. These fiery green complexes do put a lot of those three putt percentage, the ability to scramble. That's a premium that's going to have to come into your model. You can talk about this maybe being a little bit softer if there's rain, there's some wind that's in the forecast right now. I think that might help distance a little bit more than I initially was planning to to weigh this. I I know we talk about a 7,400 yard plus course and you always think that distance is kind of the the, the necessity of what you need, but as long as you're in the top 40% of that field or in this field with that portion of your game, I, I think you have enough of a reason to find high-end success. There's a lot of names historically that have won this tournament that are not those bomb and gouge kings like a Bryson DeChambeau. Over-aggression is a problem. You still need to find fairways. So as I said, Roberto, this is a nuanced course. Um, but from a betting perspective, it really opens up some windows because there's group think mentalities that are occurring across the board in a lot of these spots. And some of it's warranted, some of it's a little bit too overcorrected from it. But uh, to me, that is how we find value. We find values when there's a disparity in the public thought process versus the analytical and mathematical thought processes that come into play. I like it. Uh, a couple things that I'd add Stroke skating around the green, major emphasis this week. Approach play over 150 yards. Uh, basically, every bucket of 25 yards over 150 yards is above the tour average. Uh, you mentioned the compl complex green, so three putt avoidance, something that I'm I'm uh, weighed more than normal. And you mentioned the length. It's going to play long, given that there's a 95% chance of rain on Thursday. It looks like those are probably going to be some thunderstorms, so there may be a delay. I am going to monitor that. I'm keeping some room on my card because I think there might be a wave advantage. So I'm wading into the water a little bit cautiously right now. And in addition to there being this being a golf course over 7,500 yards, it's going to be uh, wet. So not going to be a lot of rollout. So even more of an advantage for the bombers. And also they mowed these greens into the T facing the T's so that there's less rollout than there would otherwise be. So for all these reasons, I think it does favor a bomber. And so being a long golfer off the tee is going to be something that I value a lot this week. And with that being said, guys, let's jump into our outright betting cards. Spencer, I'll swing it back to you. Who you got on your outright card so far this week? Here's the thing, guys. So... No outright card of mine is going to probably ever look perfect during a major championship for all the reasons that I talked about. I'm willing to ignore the public perception and grab some of these heightened numbers that we got in the space. I always talk about how once books know of an answer, the value's gone. You're going to see that with Jordan Spieth. I've talked about the Augusta course history that we have from him. A name like Joaquin Neiman. My model loved Joaquin Neiman this week. I think there's a, a real big argument to be made that if he would have stayed on the PGA Tour, we could be viewing him in a much different light than we're getting during this event. But the problem that's come into play, look, you can shop around and find different numbers. That's the whole point of major championships and making sure you get the best price. Shops are always going to, to try to match and give you boosts. And there's different ways to get better numbers out there. But this Neiman number has gone from, I mean, six months ago when we didn't know he was in the tournament, he was over a hundred to one. He's now sub 30 to one, no matter where you're looking at. So I like Neiman. I like Spieth. I'm just afraid that when markets opened up initially, we kind of lost value in a lot of those spots. So for me, the very first ticket I punched, I did this on Saturday. This has now dropped more into that 16 to 18 to one range. I still think there's value in that number, but Xander Shoffley at anywhere between 16 to 22 to one, I sign off on that. I understand that most think of Shoffley and don't necessarily think upside when you, when you look at his name, there's not this major championship pedigree as far as actually winning these events, but his 2024 statistical profile does quite the job of rivaling what you're really going to find with Scotty Scheffler inside of my sheet. He ranked first in my model uh, for proximity over 200 yards in 2024 
weighted proximity from 150 to 175 yards over a two-year running perspective. Those are the numbers that Roberto's talked about. You need to be good from 150 plus. He fits pretty much all of those narratives that we're talking about there throughout a two-year duration. Number one in my model and expected par three and par four scoring. The number one weighted scrambler, you know you got a scrambler on this course. And number one for projected strokes gain total. That is a recalculation specifically for Augusta National. I know that that's not going to be everybody's cup of tea when you hear that bet. There is this public sentiment that Xander cannot win, but three top five finishes in his last four tournaments. I really think that this is the time this is Xander's ever going to announce himself as a true contender in these tournaments and a guy who can win major championships. This might be the best opportunity he's ever had. So I don't want to look at these past results from him and cross him out on that. The data tells me a completely different story to where if we had one victory on his profile at any point in the last six months, I have a more in that 12 to 14 to one range. And I know that's where numbers are currently moving right now. I do think it's sharp money that's pushing it, but um, that's kind of my mentality on Xander there. I took Matthew Fitzpatrick. I got it at 50 to one. You can still get it at 40 to one. That's going to be value inside of my model. I think what intrigued me most about his profile is that he's going to deliver this quality expected driving for me. You get this immaculate short game return, this increased weight of proximity output for Augusta. But really the one thing that was the most intriguing when you dive into the profile, and I mentioned it last week, even talking about him at the Valero, he had that four gram weight that was put onto his driver for almost a year. He said he removed it during the waste management. Since that moment, he's gained a little under one stroke uh, off the tee. Before that point, he had lost a little bit less than one stroke off the tee. So you're looking at about a two-shot disparity there, a little bit less than that number of what Fitzpatrick has done with the weight and without the weight. I think this is the perfect course for him to really find that high-end success, hard scoring conditions. That's always what we're looking for with him. And now this added distance because of the speed trading. I, I think that that's kind of the the one blueprint that always removed him from my model, but it pushes him back to the forefront of the discussion there. And then, you know, Roberto, like I warned everybody of this last week. We had this discussion uh, Rory's going to put this meaningless ascension up the leaderboard at the Valero. It's going to sell me again. You would think I would know better by now when we call it directly before it happens. Rory McIlroy, 12 to 1. I understand what I'm getting into here. I, I know that we have gone through this 10 times now. This is going to be the 10th time that Rory has tried to complete the com career, career grand slam, but there were some words that he said during some of his press conferences in, uh, in at the Valero, sorry, that I thought were really intriguing at TPC San Antonio there. He talked about strategy. He talked about safety. He talked about things that you never hear from Rory. To me, Augusta is always the venue where he sees a wide open facility and he thinks bomb away. And at some point he makes the double or the triple bogey for everything to fall apart. He had averaged 11 bogeys per event this season over his opening five events. Got a Sunday bogey free 66. We got only four bogeys on the card in general. So you add all of that together to a golfer that put together one of the six best approach numbers inside of my database throughout his entire career of me tracking him back to, you know, the very beginning there. Um, we finally have some stats that are trending. And if you really want to compare those numbers to like what that is, it's like 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013. There's one at the Wells Fargo in 2019 where it was a very similar output, but pretty much everything outside of that 2019 one has been prime Rory in 2012, give or take. So I, I say this a lot. Nick knows this better than anybody else. I got caught in this whirlwind over and over again. I am so thankful that Alex Noren is not in this tournament to get caught on that side of it. But I really do like Rory this week. It's it's a volatile play. I just think it's important for everybody to realize out there, volatility is not always a bad thing. Volatility in the right market makes sense. If we're talking specifically winning, I understand the stress that comes in trying to accomplish this. That's an unquantifiable metric that I can't throw into a model. But statistically, the numbers like Rory this week. So that's my three outrights. I understand that there's two names on there that people usually try to write off, but um, I'm always going to trust the math in these spots, Roberto. All right. I'm making an in-pod play on the outright card. 
I've got room for it. I'm going with Rory McIlroy, 12 to 1 yeah, as well. Let's go. You I, we, we've talked about the course management on the show a few times. It's not the first time anybody's talked about this. Uh, like, oh, almost a decade ago, my friend Jay Townsend, when he was commentating on the European tour, talked. he tweeted out that Rory's McIlroy was really poor. Um, I think he described it exactly as like some of the worst course management he's seen outside of like under 10 year old boys golf. And Rory <laughs> quit back at him and said like, you're a failed golfer and you're a commentator. I don't care. Blah, 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 blah. But it looks like he's finally coming around on this. And like you said, he's had these blow ups this year where earlier at Pebble beach, he was at six, seven under par, the favorite to be the winner. And I don't think he even made the cut. Um, <laughs> It's remarkable what's happened with Rory McIlroy this season as far as the ups and downs, but the whole idea of this year for him is to be peaking at the right time for the major championships. We know that he's got a chance to be the sixth golfer ever to win the modern Grand Slam with a victory this week in his 10th opportunity. I love the off the tee play, obviously. Last year, even though he missed the cut, he was second in strokes gain off the tee as far as a per round basis. But it was the aggressive shots after his tee shots that set him up uh, for failure. I love the metrics on approach, best approach week of his career since 2019. As far as ball striking goes, one of the best in a while as well. Gain strokes across the board last week at the Valero Texas Open and a course where it's pretty tough off the tee. If you miss, you're playing Hill Country Golf, so you're in trees, you're in rocks. It's awkward. Um I really like Rory peaking this time. I think the comments are kind of what pushed me over the top. Obviously, it's a good fit for him with the driver. It always has been. And you mentioned the sticky course history. Yeah, he missed the cut last year. But he's still got seven top tens in the last... Or sorry, he's still got six top tens in his last ten tries here. So Rory McIlroy, I think, fits this week. I don't know the last time that I bet Rory McIlroy. I really can't remember it. I'm not... A Rory guy. He's not my favorite golfer, but I think the fit is undeniable this week at 10 to one. I was a little reserved, but we, it's drifted to 12 to one since the open or since at least the last putt at the Valero dropped. And I'm going to jump on him at 12 to one. Additionally, sticking with the theme of drivers, I'm on Oberg. I saw him pop at around 22 nice. to one. Didn't love that. He's, a, he's drifted to 33 to one. I waited for it. I'm ready for Oberg. I love his chances this week. There's not a weakness in the game. And off the tee, approach numbers have been awesome as well. So I think he's got massive upside. I'm also very intrigued by William Clark. Rory McIlroy uh, getting on my card, I think, pushes him off. So I additionally have a play on Benny on at 150 to 1. I know you laid out why you love him, Nick. For all those reasons, why I, I like him. Why, why I like him. I, I mean, it's still plus two eighty in the market. I took him, but I do, I do like him a lot as a contrarian play. God, I, I don't have room for Rory boys. I don't know what to do here. Maybe I'll just go one hundred percent DFS, fade Scotty, dig my own grave, and then I could ride with you guys if he wins. There is a discussion to be had about what to do with Scotty Scheffler for DFS. I know that's not what the purpose of this show is. Um, we can have it if you guys want, but I, I think there's we'll a really inter- I'm okay. There, there's some really interesting game theory perspectives to talk about with with Scotty, just with the price tag up there. But Nick, let me let me ask you this, and uh, Roberto, I'll let you get back to your card in a second. I'm just genuinely curious on this answer. Um, we're talking about market overcorrections that are occurring specifically because of these built-in answers of first timers don't win a lot of those narratives that keep getting blown over and over again. What did you have a proper price on for Wyndham Clark? And what did you have a proper price on for Oberg? All right. Wyndham, where is Wyndham here? I have him at 34 to one in my numbers. So I don't think that doesn't, what does what he, I guess. You can find him at 40, I believe if you shop around. Yeah. And then, <laughs> Some books have 25, some have 18. What is going on out there? That's that's hilarious. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I did weight driving very heavily, that mid-iron play that he's just been lights out for 15, 16 months. I, I get the Wyndham love, but for me, I did get to the window with uh, Ludwig. I had him at 30 as proper, and I found 38 and a half out there 
Mm -hmm. um, one of the newer books out there. So that's, I loved it. The same reasons that Roberto said, I was trying to find a way to get Ludwig exposure. I was talking to my friends on Monday. I was like, I'm probably just going to go top 10. But I, everything about his swing, everything about his game, even his short game and scrambling, all that is awesome. But what really pushed me over the edge, and it looks like, like I, I would ex ex have expected him to open in the 40s. I didn't think it opened in the 20s. But I think this this shows the bookmaker's love for like or respect for very good caddies. Joe Scoprin was awesome with Ricky Fowler, and he brought uh, Tom Kim here as a debutante last year. And Tom Kim does not fit this course, especially in last year's weather, anywhere nearly like Ludwig uh, Oberg does. And he gets T sixteen. So you give me Scoprin on a guy that should you know maybe we want Ludwig on a course where hitting fairways is a little bit more of a premium with the distance, but. Everything else, man, uh, I think it's perfect. Scavron's going to know exactly where Ludwig wants to hit the ball or should hit the ball, and Ludwig will probably put it on a rope and hit those spots. I, I think this is a great chance for him. And 33-1, to 1, I would still take that with the, the edge rules that I have for me, having him at 30. But when I saw 38-1, to 1, I was in. I was telling myself I wasn't betting him outright. I was just going to go top 10, but I saw the 38, and I'm, I'm ready to go. So, Roberto, I'm with you. Everything you said about him, but I really do – love researching these guys caddies and how they've looped around here before how they've done you know what kind of player did they have on the bag when they did that and there you go so he checks every single box for me with one of the world's best caddies yeah how many debutantes at the masters have caddies who are as experienced as joe scovern i would say that's unusual and ludwig also is an unusual talent in a variety of ways uh, with the long yep. iron play with the combination of driving accuracy above average and the prodigious length. So we talked enough about him. I'll move on. Um, I've also got some futures. I got Willie Z at 40 to one. You can find that right now in the marketplace. I am not as high on Willie Z as I was when I placed the bet, but the sticky course history, the strong play at Riviera, which I think has some commonality. You mentioned earlier, Spencer, how, Joaquin Neiman won there earlier in his career. I think that's an interesting uh, look. Of course, Bubba Watson won there a couple times, winner at the Master a couple times as well. I'm intrigued there. Speaking of lefties, one guy who's not on my card right now that I'm very intrigued by is Akshay Batia. What a performance this week at the Valero, both he and Denny McCarthy going out there and shooting 19 under, 20 under, 20 under, I believe. Denny um, lit that place Oh, unbelievable. I can't believe you, man, you get to a, a, what do you say too? Like a hundred was a full swing for him. So that's a great number for a golfer, especially like, I don't think he's a good wedge player, but I don't think that's like the strength of his game. It's obviously the flat stick, but man, you get to a full swing and then just <laughs> chunk it in the water, man, been there. But that was a, that was a fun, fun Sunday. Sorry. I'm, I'm excited, Roberto. I got a, uh, live from the masters on the background here just getting amped up but yeah dude that <laughs> that shot we you know you're a golfer so you get it like we've all hit that shot before and to think a pro and a playoff would do that with the day that he had like his swing was on autopilot and man that that sucked to see but good for Akshay I walked that back nine at uh, TPC San Antonio Oaks course on Saturday morning and the par fives are long they're hard you they're legit three shotters at yeah. over 590 yards the par threes are tough. There's one drivable par four. So you got one birdie there, but that's it. I did not see a 28 on that side. He shot 28. I don't know how he did that. But Akshay Batia is a lefty. We just mentioned Bubba Watson. Guys who move the ball from right to left have an advantage. That's also one reason why I like Roy McElroy. That's one reason why I'm very high on Xander Shoffley this week, although I missed my opportunity to bet him in the outright market right now, it looks like. All those reasons, especially with number two, the par five, being moved its tee box back and more specifically left only 10 yards, but that brings in the left trees for a lot of the faders. That was one of the reasons why I decided to go with a Rory McIlroy over somebody like a Wyndham Clark, who is very much a stock fade golfer uh, as a right-hander. And so I am very intrigued by Akshay Batia, who hits a fade as a lefty, but he can move it around as well. Really strong approach player but there is that first time masters factor and also the potential shorter shoulder injury i know he said it's not a new thing uh i'm on the fence about him but i think i'm going to try to find some way to back him this week i also have a couple other futures 
of varying value. I have Cam Davis, 201. I don't think we need to discuss that. We'll take that L and we'll move on. Taylor Moore, 250 to one. That's pretty much what you can find him at in the market right now. And then my one future with some value is Digala at 100 to one. And then that was from last summer. And then I bet him at 80 to one again after he played well at the century and finished second. So that's my outright card. Nick, who you got on yours outside of Ludwig Oberg? Um, if you guys want to take a guess, I need help. I need a number to call. Tony Finau, 43 to 1. <laughs> like, honestly, everything Spencer said about Xander Shoffley, I was like, well, it's kind of checking the box for Tony Finau minus uh, the closing ability. But his game is in such good form. Obviously, the putter's a, you know sketchy, but I feel like it's gotten better since it went toe down like you talked about it. The Mexico Open. I, I don't need to talk about Tony Fino. I do it every damn week. I'm sorry about that. Um, I did take Ludwig. We talked about that. I took the bait on Victor Hovland at 40 to 1. I don't know if I like that ticket. I've never gotten Victor right. Um, obviously, he's back with Dana. I don't think that's that's been like two day news. So I don't, you know, I can't imagine he worked on a whole lot and listened to his presser today. He seems like very concerned with where his swing's at, said he hasn't worked on his short game at all because he's really trying to get his long irons back into form to where he doesn't have to worry about short game, which is kind of alarming because even, you know, the best iron player in the world is still going to have to chip around these greens. Like Spencer mentioned, that around the green factor is a thing, especially when you're short-sided here. Like, if you miss a green and you're short-sided, you're probably playing for bogey as as, as opposed to playing to get up and down to get for par just to – you know, no doubles defense type of stuff when you miss the greens here. So I don't really like that. I'm interested to hear your guys' take on Victor Hopland, but I had the number even with such a heavy weight on the around the green play at 34 to 1. So technically, it's I regret that ticket now because I have room if I take him off for Xander, and I love Xander more than I like Tony Fee now. So to hear Spencer just like pretty much tell everybody to take all the money in their wallet and put it on Xander, it's a guarantee <laughs> like that. That's tough. For me not to be a part of, but also last ticket, uh, Ben on, obviously I don't need to talk about him as well, but, um, the 150 that you found there, that's I'm, I'm in, but I took Justin Thomas at 57 to one. The, the form sure is sketchy. It's mainly the putter for me, but again, a guy that's struggles to hit fairways, hitting it really long. And we talked about it earlier in the year too, when he started to come on in the iron plays, like where it was a couple of years ago. I had him pinned right around 30 to one, um, no matter what I do with my numbers. If I weight like other bookmakers that I respect very heavily into my numbers, I guess the worst he'd get for me is 42 to one, but for 57 to one, I had to do it. Like he is a great course history guy, you know, bones is off the bag. Now I don't, I'm sure that relationship was fantastic. I hope it didn't end in bad blood, but like maybe there's just less pressure. I don't hear anybody talking about JT. I don't really believe he could win. I, I guess, you know, I'm calling a bluff at 57 to one that his impro- implied probability is higher than what they're showing, but I don't know, man. I, I trust the short game. I trust the irons. If everything clicks and he stays out of trouble and kind of plays it like you guys mentioned, Rory's talking about playing. I think that Justin Thomas could certainly shock the world here. And the number's just too high for a guy of his upside and the ball striking that we've seen come back to play. So yeah, I'm, I took JT at 57. I want to say a couple of things about that because there's a few players that you talked about. First of all, Nick, I think I like Xander Shoffley probably on the same level that you like Ben yeah, on. I think absolutely. it's it's oh, very even know. there, just just, just <laughs> unloading that area. But <laughs> here's the problem that I have with JT. My math, and I'm running things from a longer term duration of time, maybe that hurts Justin Thomas a little bit more than it would in a, in a model that's taking and incorporating what we have seen more recently. I know the some of the more recent stuff with the putter is not exactly where you want it to be, but like I had the proper price. Whether this is right or wrong, there's a lot of weeks where my model is very aggressive in both good and bad ways with it. I had proper more in the hundred to one range. Like good he God. was he was one of the most significant fade candidates that I had on the board. It doesn't mean that he doesn't have upside, which is why I think like an outright ticket makes exactly. sense. Um, yeah. I have very much considered betting Cameron Young in a matchup against him. I don't necessarily love Cameron Young. Um, I do like him more than I than I have for Justin Thomas. I haven't gotten there yet, but I think the Hovland Finau route, both of those areas, positive climbers in my model for upside. That's an every week answer. We could come on this show 
specifically fee now we we literally come on the show every week and talk yeah, about that but auto play for me at this point I, I, like if i'm directly comparing though I, I think both of those two guys their win equity compared to a thomas is night and day and i think there's legitimate reasons to consider a hovland at 40 to 1 i know the around the green stuff is what's going to scare everybody off and that's why the number is heightened but incredible weighted uh scoring numbers in my model any of the real data that I was looking for, I guess the thing that would scare me most is what you talked about is if the swing is broken and he is in his head, then it doesn't matter what the numbers say because it's just going to go south for him. But I think outside of that perspective, which is a real problem, I think analytically he looks great. And then yeah, Finau for me, like there's not going to be a tournament where he's not a top 10 or 11 win equity candidate. And we're just going to keep recycling those comments every single week until something changes. Was was Justin Thomas like when you were doing your numbers? Do you use like recent data? Like, do you put it, you add more data for like majors when you're mm-hmm. handicapping majors? So, okay, then I could see, yeah, well, because what he hasn't, when's the last time he made a cut at a major? Was it's been a while off the top of my head? Let me pull that up. So, so I added a couple of five at PGA Championship. That's all, yeah. So he hasn't finished, uh, he won the 22 PGA and then it's been bad ever since. I added a couple things. I did throw in the major major championship pedigree, very small weight. It's not going to cause a massive deviation uh, from what I'm running. But I also ran specifically 2024 stats and merged that back in with a lot of my numbers. Like that's already what's being done, but I just added a second merger of it within my sheet. So um, it's just some of that expected weighted proximity for Augusta that scared me. Like he was outside of the top 50. I know the recent iron play is going to look a a lot better and maybe that's where the ball striking makes sense. But there has been years of him at this course where he has imploded on these greens. It's very early in his career. He's gotten better since those early stages of it. But if you look at some of those couple of first times he played this course, he really went South. I know he's, yeah, I I know he's, I know he has the capabilities with that short game to always find success. But if you're bringing your, I mean, to me, this is like his C level around the green game, maybe his D level. It's like he's at the bottom barrel of what he can produce in a lot of these spots. I- I'm worried that the putter in the around the green game, one of those two areas just go south for him this week. That's fair. Okay. In his last seven starts at Augusta, he's got six top 22 finishes, but he did miss the cut last year. I think that and last year was a disaster of like last year was a disaster. Brooks talked about how much like mental toughness you needed just to hang around that course with how slow everything was playing. And also I love the fact that they paired him up with Brian Harmon. Just get to <laughs> watch him waggle all day long. Someone, someone in the world will dislike Brian Harmon more than me after Thursday, Friday, and it's going to be Brooks Kepka, And that'll be great to hear someone else dog on him besides myself. After last year where he had to wait on Cantley. Now they pair him with uh, with Harmon. What a what a job uh, by Augusta National this week. Yeah, Guys, we'll do you one better, Brooks. Try it, Mister Fifty Waggles. We don't get to see Brooks Kepka playing with PJ Tour players very often, but someone whom we seemingly get to see even less often is Tiger Woods, greatest golfer of all times in the field this week. He is looking for a sixth green jacket. And he's made the cut here 23 times in a row. With one more made cut, he would set the Masters record with 24 consecutive made cuts. It's around even money on each side. Uh, I think right now the best we could find is plus 100 to make the cut. I think around minus 120 is the best in the market for him to miss the cut. If you guys have a lean or you had to bet one of those two sides, which one would you bet and... Do you actually recommend doing so? I'll start with you, Spencer. Nobody understands the nuances of Augusta National better than Tiger Woods. I always worry, and I, and I think from a made cut answer, that this alleviates some of those concerns. To an extent, I, I still think there's a possibility that we could go through 18 or less holes, 25 holes, whatever the number ends up being, and he can't get through the rounds there. But... um you know, we saw last year he made the cut. He was forced to withdraw from the tournament. I will say my model projected him to make the weekend. I think a lot of those nuance factors come into play. And even without adding those secondary nuance factors, my model doesn't necessarily hate him as much as you would think it would in most of these ways of running. And, you know, Nick, you can tell me where Tiger is in your model, but 
Like Tiger was a fringe top 50 player for me this week, uh, specifically at this venue. I don't know what the upside actually is. I would be very cautious of actually betting this for anything beyond what we're talking about with the made cut here. But um, if you tell me for 36 holes, he can get himself into the weekend and make a cut. Like as long as the book is still going to pay out that made cut, even if he removes himself from the field, I don't have a problem with Tiger to make the cut. Like he has proven everybody wrong so many times throughout his career. I'm not going to be the one standing there and letting him r- run me over when he consistently finds a way to produce at Augusta specifically, but really in a lot of these spots when when push comes to shove. Nick, are you with Spencer? Yeah, he's 56 and my numbers don't have a lean either way. I get, Well, I have a lean. I'd go in favor of him making the cut for sure. And hearing him talk today too, like, I, I shouldn't hear him talk because it makes me really excited to like get exposure to him some way somehow. But he really truly believes that he could play with these guys and he could play with these guys this weekend. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But depending on the weather Thursday and what happens Friday, if they got to play all day long, I don't know how that's going to be for the body. But I would still lean that. Yeah, just because he knows every nook and cranny on this course, make the cut. Yeah, no doubt. There's certain guys from a mental standpoint that will themselves to even greater than what they're capable of producing. You think of Kobe Bryant in basketball, like nobody had drive and work ethic in the way that he always pushed himself in those spots. Tiger Woods is Kobe like for the world of golf, like his ability to arise to the occasion. That's what made and still continues to make Tiger the most beloved golfer of all time. You think of every single moment in history where the the deck was stacked against him. He needed something miraculous. And you know we can talk about today's version of golf of all these guys who maybe don't put the pieces together when it's needed. Tiger delivered over and over and over again. And he gave you those classic fist pumps in the process of doing it. And those are iconic moments in golf history for that reason. So I know people are still holding on to that, but... I kind of think, and it's a weird argument to make because from an outright betting perspective, you're still going to have every average Joe running to the counter to bet him at these 200 to one numbers and think they're getting value. But I actually think from a sharp market perspective, there's ways to consider him this week um, just because sharp betters for the most part are so out on this game. And there's been this narrative for 10 plus years now for the most point or the most part, like I know he won Augusta a handful of years ago, but most of the time that it's this Jordan Spieth answer. I know I keep picking on him, but like the market pushes him down. I actually think that we've gone the other way with Tiger in a lot of respects here. Yeah, normally we've been priced out on Tiger, but this week I actually did bet him at even money exactly to make the cut. He's made it 23 times in a row. He couldn't walk last year. He had ankle fusion surgery the same month that he withdrew from this tournament. He looked much, much better physically at Riviera when he withdrew. It was because of illness, not because of an injury. He was one shot behind the cut line there at a course that he has never excelled on in his career. And this is the course that suits his game better than just about anywhere else. The fairways are wider. That's the one weakness in Tiger Woods' game is the driving accuracy. And he could still move it out there. They they were talking about how he was hitting it past Will Zalatoris in his practice round yesterday. I think Tiger makes the weekend as long as he can walk. And I also like that he has the later afternoon tea time on Thursday. So if there is a rain delay, he's not going to be out there all day Thursday morning uh, until the late evening. He'd be there a little bit less, but he will have a quicker turnaround. Uh, So there's that as well. It's one of the toughest courses to walk on the entire professional golf circuit. But overall, I think he's got what it does, what it takes to make the cut this week in this smaller field. If this was the PGA championship, I think it would be a lot tougher with uh, the full field, but at this golf course, I'm going to ride with Tiger Woods all day long. Give me that at even money to make the cut guys wanted to give a reminder that this podcast is presented by North Carolina's newest sports book, bet three, six, five, bet three, six, five doesn't do ordinary. And that's why you get more boosts with them than with anyone else. Every day, they power up the odds on hundreds of bets to give you a chance to win more. Bet365 boosts specific markets, your winnings, and even parlays. And they don't stop there. Keep an eye out for their biggest and best odds with the incredible Super Boost. 
Check out the boost and see why it's never ordinary at Bet365. Must be 31 or older and present in Arizona, Colorado, Indiana, Iowa, Louisiana, North Carolina, New Jersey, Ohio, Virginia, or 18 and older in Kentucky. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. All right, gentlemen, what else do we have on our betting cards this week? Nick, I'll swing it back to you. All right, to close us off, last thing, uh, I did take Ben on as well, top 10 um, with the top 20. The top 10 is plus 750, ties paid in full. Followed Spencer on Ekro to make the cut as the in-pod play, and then I found a little value on a, you know, gimmicky market, but it's our guy. He paid off for us at Houston, so thank you to Spencer and thank you to the German Hammer. I'm going to go with top debutante, Steven Yeager at 14 to 1. I just feel like I I had that. I let me see when I handicapped that market. I I can tell you what I had proper on that too because that's the best number that I've seen in the space at fourteen to one. That's a that's a good price. Yeah, it's it's in the legal market. It's it's out there. Uh, I had him at nine to one. I had a pretty much a ten percent equity on him there. Obviously, Ludwig's going to suck up the majority of that. Wyndham Clark, the majority of that. But man, fourteen to one. Like saying he's what is that seven percent? chance of him winning that market I, I will disagree with that and take the three percent edge that i have on paper and he's got another great caddy too i don't think he's got much august experience but steven yeager fits his course very very well obviously the, the putting woes we'll see what happens there i don't did you have this as a plus putting for his baseline on this what i can even say it's lightning bent grass this week with all the rain that's going to come thursday i know that it'll drain out by the weekend but It'll be fast. I, don't think I it'll still be think it's good. I still think it'll be quick. They'll, yeah. They always seem to get this course pretty baked out by the weekend. Um, no, unfortunately, I have him as a negative movement with the putter. He drops from 45th to 69th on this course. There's uh, negative returns for bent grass putting, negative returns for these, you know, if you want to call them lightning quick greens, if we don't want to go quite in that direction, there's still the bent grass, I guess, downturn on it. But I, I agree with you. Overall, with that sentiment of Jaeger, like Wyndham Clark, I like him this week. He does have the wrong shot shape that we're looking for for this course. I, I think there's ways he can get around it. I don't necessarily worry as much as maybe some people do. We're still talking about Oberg here, where at least historically, like the only downside quality that I have for him is, and it's a weird answer to give, he's been shorter at or better at these club down courses than some of these lengthier tests. I don't think it's necessarily a problem, but if we're trying to poke holes into some of these profiles here, I had Jaeger proper at 11 and a half to one. So I'm not quite as big of an edge as you do, Nick, but still based off of that 14 to one number, uh, a little bit of value there to be had. I like it. Spencer, what else do you have on your betting card this week? Talked about Kirk over EVR. Shop around, see if you can find that number. Discuss the Cameron Young over Justin Thomas thing. I I just don't have the 3% edge that I want, but I am trying to find a reason to fade Justin Thomas this week. So we'll see if I end up jumping on that one. And then the only other two bets that I have punched right now would be, I took Matthew Fitzpatrick plus 130 for a top 20. A lot of what I talked about of him having the extra weight on his driver his added distance that he's added here. I think this is a really nice course fit for a player that's made back-to-back top 15 finishes at this course. And then I took Harris English for a top 20 at plus 345. If you shop around in the market, you can still find it in the plus 320 range. I had 270 more of being the proper number there, but course history is okay. I don't think it's anything necessarily to write home about, but three made cuts in four attempts. There is nothing better than a 21st place finish if we're talking specifically about a top 20 here. But I think the interesting note to that factor is he is, he first played Augusta in 2014. He has played it four times. He has never gotten the ability to play it in back-to-back years before this go around here. So maybe there will be some ability where he's able to roll over from what he has done last year. I know that the miscut that he provided at the Valero scares some people out 4.3 strokes ball striking that he lost. But I always say that when you get these overcorrections in the market, which is what this is to me here, numbers shifted. And if he had not missed the cut in San Antonio, 
I really think we're looking more in a position here where he's probably in the low 200s, mid 200s here for a top 20. So I'm going to take the value where it is. He's been averaging 3.35 shots tee to green before last week. Four top 21 finishes if you want to throw those into the mix. Uh, quality around the green and putter for this course. So I think there's a lot to like about him. And I've kind of talked about this quite a few times this week. And I don't think that this is like necessarily like the only thing that matters, but I always write this article, the seven deadly sins, and it tries to look for golfers that you cannot do certain things. If you actually want to win at Augusta national, I've written it five times, all five times it's narrowed down to the eventual winner that we got. Every single name on there is the names you would expect. It's the Roms and the Rory's and the Scotties and Xander and all of those names. There was one option for me outside of 100 to 1 who landed on that list. That was Harris English at 175 to 1. So that might be a little bit too aggressive as an outright ticket. For the price, I, I've made worse bets in my life before. But at the bare minimum, I think as a top 20 at plus 345 or anywhere in that plus 300 range makes a lot of sense. I like Harris English a lot. I'm going to tail that top 20 play. So let's ride with that Georgia Bulldog. Looking at the rest of my card, I've also got a play on Corey Connors, minus 125 over Minwoo Lee. I really don't like laying juice like this, but I think there's just such a big ball striking disparity between these two players where Connors has gained on approach in 13 consecutive starts, Minwoo Lee, uh, and and also in all nine tournaments so, so far this year. Minwoo Lee this year in 2024 has gained strokes on approach in just two of seven track tournaments, and he lost strokes on approach in both of his Masters appearances so far in his career. One of them, I believe, was a miscut. The other one was a tie for 14th. I think that there's a lot of hype around Minwoo Lee, but I'm very comfortable backing Corey Connors and what is a significant ball striking advantage, even though the putter for Corey Connors is a major question mark. I also... Real, gonna real bet. quick, Roberto, news yeah. that Minwoo Lee is playing with a broken finger that he just broke with a dumbbell less than half a week ago, or a week and a half ago, sorry. So, okay. While I, we're on the pod, I just got that one. Came across my I, desk. I, so I he played nine holes pain-free, but ball. yeah, broken finger, I, I can't imagine how you do that. That's hard. Um, I don't know. That number is going to move. Um, if nothing else, if we're already out to that number before this news is broken, that number is probably going to shift another 25 to 50 points before this is all said and done. That would be my guess to the mix here. So I uh, definitely like that stance there based off of that news. Additionally, I also like Victor Hovland 26 or worse at minus 120. Didn't find a matchup that I liked against him yet, at least. So I'm going to bet that for a small amount. And then that's also on our sponsor, Bet365, by the way. So you can bet it there. If I find another matchup, I'll bet that in addition to this. Or if not, I'll just add a little bit more. So, but I want to fade Victor Hovland in some fashion. Also, just to note, like, I'm reading the update right now on Min Lee. How tough are you that you break your finger, you go out and you play nine practice holes, and you just feel no pain? I'm sitting here right now and my shoulder hurts. I've done nothing. I've been typing all day. Like I, I don't know how he's playing golf with a broken finger. Yeah. We need Akshay's trainer to get you taped up. I've been noticing you doing that whole thing with your shoulder there. Yeah. That's nuts. I don't know. He's a, he's a warrior. He's just the people's, the people's golfer, but I'm with you, Roberto. I think that's someone I certainly want to pick on pre this news too. So yeah, I, I don't know. I can't imagine that bodes well for him. All right, guys, we've mentioned everything on our cards. We've gone through our outright bets. We've gone through the course preview. We've gone through our best bets. Let's get to one and done. I'll get it going here. I am probably wanting to save Rory McIlroy, but I like him this week a lot. I just bet him at 12 to 1, so I'm considering betting him. I wanted to get some exposure to Shoffley, so I'm considering betting. I'm considering using him for one and done. And I'm also considering using Brooks Koepka because it's a major championship and we're not going to get a chance to use him other than the three other majors. Those are the three guys that I'm in between. I think right now I have Shoffley in there, but to be determined on which one I eventually use. Nick, who you got in one and done this year, this week? I don't get ridiculed here. Um, I'm going to take Scotty Scheffler in our contest because I have saved him and it's just time. Uh, should have used him at the players, but hindsight's, uh, you know. 
better than 2020 in my opinion at this rate now that I'm on two missed cuts in a row. Uh, otherwise, I would advise John Rahm or Brooks Kepka get one of the live guys out there, especially if you got a lead uh, and a significant lead. I think it's a great week to use one of those like true killers on the live tour. And then honorable mention, Joaquin Neiman. But I will be playing Scotty Scheffler against you guys. I like to show my hand before it goes and then always switch it Thursday morning for T off to mess with Spencer. But that won't be happening this week. Scotty Scheffler is locked in. Spencer, who you got? I can't win with you, Roberto. Just cannot win at this point. Um, I mean, I'm probably playing either Rory or Xander. I, I would like to pay you money to find out who you're playing so I can play the other one. So I give myself a real chance. Um, I, I don't know. To, like What Nick says makes a lot of sense of the live golfers. And I think for two pick contests, that's probably exactly the route I'm going to go is it's going to be a Rory and a Neiman or, or a Xander and a Neiman, something like that. You can throw Rom into the mix. Never really a Kepka guy. I'll probably save Kepka for the PGA championship. Um, those are also contests though. And I think that that's like the interesting note there. When we talk about f- front running these contests, it, it's much simpler if you're in the lead to do something like that, because that's the route everybody's going to go with it. I think it makes it much more challenging when you're playing catch up, which is what I'm doing here in the action contest. Then, Every single week, it just seems like I can't actually make up ground because, Roberto, you're just throwing in names and Jaeger's coming into play out of nowhere. And, you know, I was, I think I was maybe going to get Rory to myself cleanly. And now all of a sudden it might be Rory. It might be Xander. It might be Rory for me. It might be Xander. Let's flip a coin. And my luck of flipping a coin, I will land on the same exact person that you have played. I... Did not play Fitzpatrick when I knew you were playing Fitz last week. So I got away with that uh, with my Tommy Fleetwood play. So hopefully I'm off the shit list for a week, but I might be back (laughs) on the next pod. (laughs) No, you you are as of this moment. I I do think that if you did say Fitzpatrick, I really like the spot for him. Um, Unfortunately, it's funny, Roberto, because I never want to play Fitzpatrick. Really, like you can play him at Heritage. That's always a spot where it makes sense. But there's very few options in my model to where I want to play him. He's always one of those names that lasts for a lot longer than other players. Now I've run into this, this little stance for like almost the last couple times he's played where I want to roll him out every single week. And I ended up putting him out there just because I didn't think I'd want to use him somewhere. I still think it's maybe a little bit too contrarian in some spots. I think for our contest, it would have been great to go Fitzpatrick, but I, I, I really like Fitzpatrick this week. I, I just think we're looking at a profile of a golfer that is a little bit underrated and I keep going back to this distance answer, but there's really something to that when we're talking about a two shot disparity, once the weight of the driver got removed for him. All right, guys, we've gone through our one and done. We've gone through all of our bets. Let's get a couple names. Let's get a couple thoughts on guys whom we haven't yet talked about. I'll go through the current odds on bet three, six, five. We talked a little bit about Scotty Scheffler. We haven't talked about John Rom. He's 11 to one. If you had to put a bet down right now, either on John Rahm at 11 to 1, Hideki Matsuyama at 18 to 1, Brooks Kepka at 19 to 1, or Jordan Spieth at 22 to 1, Nick, who would you like among those four? John Rahm. Spencer? I, I will double down on that answer. I think there's an argument to be made that the market has partially overcorrected itself when we look at the disparity difference between Scheffler and Rom, I'm not so sure we should be looking at a five to one versus 12 to one difference between those two. Scheffler should be the favorite. I have no arguments or gripes in that area, but I think Rom has drifted ever so slightly too much and is really an option to consider in the outright market. I, I will not be surprised whatsoever if he goes back to back here. Moving on, we touched on most of the guys in the 21 range. So let's skip all the way down to 35 to 1. That's where Patrick Cantley is. So is Bryson DeChambeau. Will Zalatoris is 38 to 1. JT's 38 to 1 here. That's moved a lot today. Um, and Tommy Fleetwood and Shane Lowry are 40 to 1. So between Cantley, DeChambeau at 35, Zalatoris at 38, and Fleetwood and Lowry at 40. Nick, which golfer would you most like a ticket on? Surprisingly, I do like Bryson DeChambeau. I'll go with him. Spencer? 
I give this answer because I don't necessarily love any of the names in this group, and I cannot go on a podcast and say Patrick Cantlay. I've already gone the Rory route and Xander. If I triple dip <laughs> on this and now say Cantlay, I think that might be a little bit too much. But um, Bryson at least gives you that ace in the hole potential to where – I, we don't exactly know. I know we can have live tournaments that we point towards and we have some statistics there. I don't know if we really truly know where Bryson's at with this game. I know that he's had past struggles at this venue, but you know, you, you hope that he's turned around some of those short game metrics that had plagued him and maybe the too much aggressiveness that he's put into the mix. So I, I think if I'm going to just randomly sh- throw a dart here, it's probably going to be on Bryson when I don't necessarily want any of those names. Like I'd rather play Hovland or Finau than that group. I agree. I don't have much love for any of those guys in that, in that range. Moving on. Hate Can't lay. Can- oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, I don't, I don't hate can't lay. I mean, he was one of the names that survived that had real potential to win in my seven deadly sins article and um, take that for whatever it's worth. But I think can't lay is an intriguing name. If we want to keep talking about players that, this perception has gone too far with them. Yes. It has gone too far with Cantley at this point. This number's drifted. There was a time not that long ago, Cantley was 12 to 1 in every single field. Yep. That's where right I'm or at. wrong. Like right it. or wrong, no matter what that is. Like it's yeah. we yeah. Right. Sorry, continue. Moving on along the odds board. Cameron Smith is 45 to 1. Cameron Young. Sorry, Cameron Smith's 45 to 1. Dustin Johnson's 45 to 1. Colin Morikawa is also 45 to 1. And so is Sahith Thigala. Among those four golfers at 45 to 1, which one would you most like a ticket on, Nick? Oh, boy. <laughs> That's how I feel. I don't like any of them. I'm, I'm out on this Thigala steam that just, I can't do it. <sighs> Dustin? Question mark? Like, hey, Dustin. I don't like it. I don't like any of it. Spencer? Oh. I'll say Cameron Smith, which I think there's been an overcorrection to his number with just what we have seen with him pulling out from food poisoning in the live tournament. I guess I'd give a very close secondary answer as Dustin, but I, pretty much those last. 10 to 12 names that you've mentioned, like those are not guys that have been really anywhere near consideration of my outright card for the most part outside of Cantley, who I, I play this game every single week with him. Well, hopefully you listen to the pod and you got the better prices on the gala. Uh, moving on to 50 to one Cameron Young's 50 Brian Harmon's 55 to one Max Homa is 60 to one Sam Burns is 60 to one Tyrrell Hatton, 60 to one and our man, Jason Day playing alongside Tiger Woods is also 60 to 1. Among Cam Young, Brian Harmon, Max Homa, Sam Burns, and Jason Day, which t- guy would you most like a ticket on, Nick? I also think Cam Young is getting steamed a little too much, as much as I like him as a golfer. I'm going to go with Tyrrell Hatton. Spencer? I will go with Max Homa. Um, it kind of just circles back to the answer that we had or that I had when talking about Homa versus Morikawa. There's a couple golfers in this range, Hatton being the second name there that experiences much more upside than some of these safety numbers. I guess for me with Hatton, and maybe this is where it gets overcorrected in that sense with it, all I can, and I, I won't say the words, but like all I can hear in my head is him saying how bad this venue is over and over again and how much he hated it. So I don't know if his attitude's gotten any better since he's left for live, but I, I mean, I guess sometimes money solves things. So who knows? <laughs> All right, guys, we've gotten through everybody at 50 to one or shorter. Where can the people find your work this week? Starting with you, Nick. I uh, should have a DFS article over at Stochastic sometime tomorrow. And then the better golf live stream. Um, we'll post it at better golf pod on Twitter or X. Uh, Spencer and I will probably name damn near every single player down the board all the way down to Fred Couples knowing us on Masters Week. But it should be a lot of fun, more of a contrarian angle and uh, tournaments, cash games, all that good stuff. We'll, we'll cover it all for you. So really looking forward to doing that show tomorrow night. And then best bets over at Action Network. Awesome. Looking forward to hearing that. Spencer, where can the people find your work this week? 
I've put out a lot, Roberto. So this morning I filmed Green Dot Daily. You can check out some of those bets to get a deeper dive. I also did a show for Action Network with Cynthia Freeland, Maria Marino. Uh, we talked about some of our favorite bets on the board for this week's tournament at Augusta. I have an article out at Action Network on Wednesday. We'll, we'll handicap where the outright board has moved at that time. Also have the in-tournament bets to discuss throughout the week. Uh, hopefully we can find some value in that market. You always hope for these major championships. You get that potential where books are a little bit more aggressive in what they release. But you can find me on Twitter at Tioff Sports. And if you like any of the numbers that you heard, you can get my model over there too. Awesome. We're going to have a ton of great content here at Action. Uh, we've already got early outrights out. We've got a few different people's betting cards. Spencer's going to have his tomorrow as well. We've got one and done picks. We've got first round leader. We've got prize picks already out there. Uh, we're going to have best bets here tonight, Tuesday night. So by the time you listen to the pod, that'll be out there as well. I've got uh, 24 storylines for the 2024 Masters that you can check out. That was published on Sunday night. I talked about how this is Xander Shoffley's best chance of winning a major and then get all the sharp movement on it. So I wasn't able to capitalize on that. Uh, but a lot to look forward to at this Masters. I'm also going to have a power ranking of every single player in the field out on Wednesday, as well as a course preview. Uh, but everybody is familiar with Augusta National, of course. We'll also have picks and recaps throughout the weekend. So picks after third, after uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday's coverage continue, uh, concludes. We'll have picks for you to consider. And then we'll also have some recaps on Tiger Woods' round and the first round as well. Uh, so be sure to check out all of our golf coverage here at Action Network. And of course, you can find me on Twitter or X at RobertoA213. Thanks to everybody who makes this podcast possible, especially uh, our producers, Matt Mitchell and Noah Niederhofer. And thanks, as always, to you, the fans, for tuning in. We hope that you found a couple winners in our pod today and you learned a little something about the burst major championship of 2024 it should be an absolute blast thanks for tuning in and we'll catch you guys next week at hilton head 